Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Kevin Hoofman, and for the last two years I've been studying online games like EVE Online to learn about the real economy. Now that may seem backwards, because like yesterday, Hilmar in his presentation in his uh, introduction was explaining that they're looking at Icelandic politics for inspiration for, for the game. But I'll try to make this make sense. I have a special as well. You may have, uh, you may have heard that there's a war going on. <laughs> there's a lot of pressure on some empires, some crumbling. Or is it? Um, and I have detail about that stuff that's never been shown at FanFest before that I will present to you guys. So, but that's at the end of the presentation. First things first. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to sit through this first. Um, my online role-playing or online gaming career started in 1993 with uh, Mushes. Um, I started with Two Moons, then later in 1994 I started playing on Dark Metal, and that's a World of Darkness mush, and you may, some of you may know why I mentioned that, but we're not going into that. Uh, I really got into this online RPG thing, and I started coding for it, and by 1997 I was Code Wizard, that's like the official mush term for lead coder, uh, on an American mash in uh, The Children of the Moon, also World of Darkness. And just for fun, this is an example of the code we used to write. It's tiny 2.0. Um, and if you think stackless Python is bad, then uh, that was something. In 1999, um, two things happened. One is I got my degree in uh, Master in Electronics Engineering, uh, arguably as important was the launch of EverQuest. EverQuest was built on a mush, but it added a 3D perspective. You could look around and see what you were, yeah, you could see around in the world. And that completely blew you know, many people's mind, probably. It was kind of the end of mushes, they were text based. And uh, yeah, there's some cool stuff in there. Like, does anyone recognize this character? And just out of curiosity, yeah, oh, ho, ho, ho. player versus player. Um, then stuff happened. By 2006, I worked for Larian Studios, a Belgian games company. The, the first user interface version of Divinity 2 was mine. Uh, also, the story designer, a story. Um, Dialogue design, sorry. Uh, the dialogue designer is mine. Um, but I did this in preparation for the next thing I do in 2006, which was co create the first game dev degree and still the best game dev degree in Belgium called Digital Arts and Entertainment. Then I started playing EVE Online. So actually, I played the game. I started as a noob, as probably everyone else. Uh, eventually, by 2009, I was, because this is 2007, 2009, the period of the Great War, right? So uh, I was caught up in that. Uh, part of the Greater Band of Brothers community, it was called, shooting people in the north. Um, and then I quit. For reasons. And in 2009, the financial crisis happened. So this intrigued me. I wanted to know what was going on. Uh, I went back to university first, part-time, then full-time. And from that came uh, a, a master's degree in, uh, in banking and finance. In 2012, I gave a TED talk, Money, Myth and Mystery. You can find it online. And then this happened. Asakai, it brought many people back to the game. For me, it was kind of different because I was now doing economics, still playing games, uh, Guild Wars 2, and now Elder Scrolls Online, so certainly not just EVE Online. But when you're doing this kind of thing, you're, you're primed to see certain patterns. You're, you start to look at economics in these games. And you have this, uh, yeah. When I, when I got back into the game in 2013, 
I uh, ended up in the Fountain War, so from the, from the Great War into the Fountain War, which was funny because this time I was on the receiving end of that. And uh, when Test and uh, Tribal Band, I think it was, uh, pulled back, I saw this, this really interesting pattern, which is the first like, result of the research I'll be showing. Basically, fire sales uh, giving you an idea of the effect that war has on markets. Okay, it's in the game, we'll get to that. And I thought this was really interesting, and I went up to uh, Kunz Roos, who's a professor in economics in Belgium. I was already working with him at the time on, on this other uh, monetary finance stuff. So I showed that to him, and, and Kunz a really brilliant guy. He recognizes opportunities, and he's like, whoa. So we decided to do something with that. And we created a research proposal, which was accepted, to research the real-world economy using virtual world data. Basically, looking at games and making conclusions about the real world. So it's not like games hadn't been researched before this. But here, we're trying to learn not stuff about the game, but stuff about the real world using data from the game, which may sound weird, and I'll have to like justify that. Uh, in short, because I don't want to bore you guys, economics is actually surprisingly different, uh, difficult. It's also very important, and that's the tricky thing. It's important in the sense that on Saturday, a bank large bank, Iceland had that, uh, Belgium had that, a large bank reports, oh yeah, we're bankrupt, we're gonna fail. On Monday, the markets will open, politicians have two days to intervene. And this is where economics, in theory, comes in. Uh, economics gives policy recommendations about economics and uh, financial markets. But the tricky thing is that a lot of this stuff isn't testable. And it's not like this is controversial. Actually, 2014, 2015, there's some debate going on about ways to test stuff in economics. And this project introduces a new way of testing things scientifically. It's called LabM, it stands for Live Agent-Based Modeling. We presented it as the theory of adaptive multi-type and multi-layer networks, uh, multi networks to study economic complexity, financial instability, and social networks through massively multiplayer online games. Surprisingly, this was really well received. Uh, we got funding from both Ghent University and Flanders, and the the idea is that we combine the best of two worlds. So uh, in economics, some studies are done using lab experiments. Basically, you take real people, you put them in a lab, and you do some stuff. So the good thing about that is you're working with real people. You don't have to make assumptions that everyone's rational, that kind of thing. And the other thing that we bring into this is that a computer game, and you probably know this, uh, it's electronic. Everything is logged, so you have a data set that is almost unique in the world of economics. So you have these two things, you bring them together, and we're going to test economic and social theories on that. So, um, some more stuff about this. Computer games, basically, they're mostly entertainment. That's usually why people play it, that's probably why you play it. Uh, but there are also different things to different people. They're a safe environment for experimenting with social interaction. Like fleet commanders, uh, you can step up and lead thousands of people to destroy the hegemon, the great whatever, band of brothers, goon swarm now. But you can also use it to uh, train your trolling skills. To us, it's a data generation machine. Uh, EVE Online, generates 15 terabytes of information about real human interaction, players, um, a year. Last year, 2015, 50 terabytes. So that's kind of cool. So we want to use that to learn about the real world. Of course, can you use any game? No. You need a game with scarcity. Basically, you want people to want stuff, and then you don't give it to them. And Evenline is really good at that. 
So you see these videos with Titans sinoing in and doomsdaying stuff, and then people are like, oh, let's play this game, and the game tells you, well, you have to wait two years. Because <laughs> first you need to train capitals, then you need to start saving for a Titan, huh? Titan, very popular ship, saving about 100 billion ISK for a Titan. Now, how long does it, this take? So if I assume one account, you're making 100 million ISK per hour, which is kind of good, right? It takes about a year and a half to make this, this much money. Uh, and then it would take you 125 eight-hour working days to save the money for a Titan. And you can lose it in a minute. So this, makes, this ensures that the players who play this game and who want this Titan, they will be really smart or trying to be smart about the decisions they make. They want to maximize their profit, they want to minimize their losses, they'll turn loss averse, that kind of thing. And you get these headlines like, eh, spaceships worth more than 200,000, eventually it was 300,000, destroying the biggest virtual space battle of uh, B-R5 or B. So this kind of game where the stakes are this high is the thing we're looking for. And to be honest, I look at any MMO, but EVE is here. And all the other game, games are like, oh yeah, we also have some economic behavior. But <laughs> EVE is kind of special because it's a sandbox. And anyway, more about it later. So there's two theories. Either one, or preferably, pre preferably both, have to be met. Um, for this research to actually make sense. One theory is that EVE is like the real world, and then it maybe mirrors the real world, and if we can show this, then we can say, look, players are behaving in this virtual world, it's a game, but they behave like the real world, so we can look at this data and make conclusions about the real world. The other theory is that EVE is part of the real world. So if we can show that Eve is real, this is of course like more far-fetched, right? <laughs> How could Eve be real? So let's look at some evidence. First of all, social organization. If we look at the population of cities, then population is uh, on the on the bottom uh, amount y-axis. Um, most cities have a low population. Ugh. Most cities have a high population, sorry about that. Um, low population, high amount of cities, voila. And a high population, there's only a few cities with a really high population. If you would plot the pattern in the middle, you get a line like this, and it behaves like a power law. Y equals x to the power a, hence the name power law. So who cares? Well, actually, power laws, you find them pretty much everywhere in nature and the social sciences. Web hits behave according to power law, word frequency, citations of scientific papers, copies of books sold, telephone calls, magnitudes of earthquakes, diameter of moon craters, intensity of solar flares, intensity of wars, wealth of the richest people, frequencies of family names, populations of cities, and so on. See paper. So an inter an interesting question is, does social structure in EVE Online demonstrate this kind of behavior? Because that would like, demonstrate that we can look at this and it's similar to the real world, so maybe there's something there. Now, there is a possibility that after this talk, you will be obsessed by power laws. And you will see them everywhere, or want to test whether you see them everywhere. So how would you test whether something behaves according to a power law? To detect power law behavior, you can do this math trick. You basically take log on both sides. And if y equals x to the power a, then logically the log of both must be the same as well. And this allows you to do a neat trick. You put a in front of log x, and then let capital Y be log Y, capital X be log X. It gives you Y equals A times X, and that's simply a straight line. Or to be more precise, 
It's actually a, a downward sloping line, so it's x to the power minus a, and we add a constant. Take log on both sides, do some math. Let capital Y be log Y, capital X be log X, B equals log C, and you get the pattern Y equals minus A time, uh, times X plus B. And that's a downward sloping line. Now to summarize, forget all the math. Take the log on both sides. Look for a downward sloping line. It's a power law. So uh, on the left, you see a um, graph of one million random numbers. And on the right, you see the log log version. So you get a straight line. Um, you can get in the tails, you can get uh, some, some uh, noise. And that's because the highest numbers, they, they don't all follow. And there, there's some gaps in between. So you get this kind of chunky behavior. This is population of cities. On the left, you have levels. Uh, um, and on the right, there's the log log version. And as you can see, it's a downward sloping line. It doesn't have to be a perfect line, but there's clearly some, uh, there's clearly the pattern there. So that's what you're looking for. Now, if we take EVE Online data, and you can do this, uh, click the link, you get today's data, um, you will get uh, alliances with their members. That's what we're looking for. And Goon Swarm Federation was, when I took this, the largest uh, alliance. It's still the largest alliance today. If you take this data, <laughs> yes, I know this is very you know, emotional for everyone what's going on. Uh, if you take this data and you take log log, then you get something like this. And we were looking for something like that, which is kind of very nice. So it suggests that. People in Evil Line, just a game, organize in alliances the way people in the real world organize in cities, which is good to see. It doesn't prove, well, it's not perfect proof, but you need to find evidence, and this is one thing suggesting that people behave similar, and it's interesting to study it if you find stuff like that. Second piece of evidence. Plex price spikes. So um, at the end of 2014, beginning 2015, the Plex price spiked with by 25%. And it was kind of sudden. And later on, August, September 2015, this happened again. And at the time, there were lots of theories. This is happening, that is happening. So the idea is to uh, look at that and maybe look for some explanations. Any ideas? There's some classic explanations like inflation. At the time, uh, the new sovereignty system was being introduced, and people were saying, yeah, old school players, they hate it. They will quit the game. Uh, they are quitting the game, and that's what's causing these spikes. Or hey, Eve is dying, no new players. That was also a theme at the time. And also classic, eh, speculating is those dirty speculators. You get this in the real world as well, eh, causing the price to go up. It's never a problem when the price goes down, but speculation, eh, terrible, terrible, terrible. So let's look at this. First of all, inflation. Uh, this is data from 2004 to 2016. Uh, these are different indices, mineral price, primary producer price, secondary producer price, CPI. Inflation in the long term, I mean, in the real world, central banks would like to show stability like that. So inflation is kind of tricky as an explanation. It's also difficult to, uh, to, to use to explain why you have sudden spikes. Oh, suddenly inflation was very high. But we don't see any inflation. Uh, for the next stuff, I have to build a Plex price model. So for the future, when you guys want to anticipate what Plex will do, you can use this model. First of all, real-world currencies. You can buy Plex with dollars or euros, sell Plex uh, with dollar, uh, uh, sorry, buy Plex with dollars or euros, and uh, in the game, you will trade with ISK. I'll explain what Plex is in a second. That's kind of important. First of all, first market. 
access to the game. If you want to play the game, you either need a subscription, which you pay in dollars or euros, or you can buy in the game this thing called Plex, like this. You go to the market. On the left, you can pick what you want to show. Then you have sellers, buyers. You pick the price. You right click. You go buy this and this item called the Pilot's License Extension, hence Plex. Uh, if you right click the item and activate it, it will give you 30 days of game time. So it's like a substitute for the subscription, but important, you're not paying, paying with real money, but with in-game money. Second market, primary market, where does this Plex come from when you can't produce it in the game? Um, the dynamic here is, if you want money in the game, like we said, eh, Eve Online is very good at letting you play the game and don't, then not give you anything. You have to buy it and you have to make ISK. Um, but there's an alternative. You can go to the EVE Online website, buy Plex, and the next time you log into the game, it will give you this as an item. You could activate it yourself, but that's kind of silly because then you're paying 20 euros. You could have paid the subscription for 15 euros. But you will sell it on the market. That's the whole idea. You put it on the market, people will buy it, and boom, instantly you have ISK. So those are the two dynamics that will play in the primary market. Then we have to look at the trading of Plex inside the game, secondary market. So we'll do an experiment, like a, an intelligence test. You're going to your favorite trading hub to buy. You're an even line player, just imagine. You're going to your favorite trading hub, like Jitta, to buy. And you're looking for Warp Disruptor 2s. So you want to do some PvP. You're looking for Warp Disruptors. And the normal price is around 2 million. You need to buy at least one, because you have to fit a ship. But at the normal price, you'll buy 10, so that you have a stash of these. So how many of these, how many Warp Disruptors, do you buy when you look at the market and see a price of 2 million? 10. If you see 3 million, like it's 50% more expensive, ouch, 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 you'll buy one, like we said. But if you find a really cheap price, <laughs> buy, buy, buy. 20 items. I just picked 20 here, I could pick anything. Um, and if we put that on graph with price on the y axis, quantity on the x axis, then, like we said, there's on just put it on the graph, 2 million, 10 items, 3 million, 1 item, 1 million, 20 items. This gives you a downward sloping line. It doesn't have to be a straight line, it could be a curve. If I picked a different number than 20, it could have been curving, like 25, whatever. Um, we call this the demand line. It shows you how much demand for the item there is at a certain price. When you read this, always read from price to quantity. I'll just throw that in. There's a whole discussion around that. But anyway, uh, suppose you wanted to buy more at these prices. So suppose that you wanted to buy 20 items at 2 million. And similar pattern at 10 items, also more at 3 million and 30 items at 1 million. Then if I keep the prices fixed, and just go for a higher quantity. Then this line shifts to the right. There we go. So a higher demand means demand shifting to the right. This is like economics in five minutes. Awesome. Now, you are going to the market, but you're a producer. You're making stuff, and you want to sell it. You're making Warp Disruptor 2s. Normally, you can sell them for 2 million. And you need cash, some cash at least. You'll sell one at any price, but normally you want to sell 10. So you go to the market, you look at offered prices, and you see 2 million. So like we said, you sell 10. If you see a bad price, you have to sell at least one, so you'll sell one. But what if you find like there's a really good price at offer? Sell everything, right? Bang, throw it on the market. Any producers here? Figured. 
So, if we put this on the graph, like we said, 10 items, 2 million, one item at 1 million, price of 3 million, 20, you get a upward sloping line. We call this a supply line because this is producers, suppliers offering it. And if you wanted to sell more at the same price, like let's say 2 million 20 items, 1 million 10 items, 3 million 30 items, then this moves to the right. So it's quite simple because you're looking at quantities and that's on the uh, X axis going from left to right. When you have higher quantities, you go to the right. When you have lower quantities, you go to the left. And the same for the supply and demand. It's the same graph, okay? But how to put it together? If we put this on the same graph, then I can intuitively show you what happens. So again, I pick a price and look at resulting quantities. At 3 million, well, there's only demand for one item. Of course, all the producers want to sell at 3 million, but that's not going to happen. So mm, if the price is too low, then the same thing basically happens, but it's the inverse. Uh, here, nobody wants to sell. But where the two meet, and is this example is at two million, here there's 10 items for sale and there's 10 buyers. So the market will clear, as they say. Woo. And this is a functioning market. So when this price go up, if demand goes up, then you can see that the price on the left is higher. If supply goes down, then price will also go up. And of course, if the two happen at the same time, it's not that common in economics. Strangely enough, it happens a lot in even life, especially with Plex. Then, of course, you get the double effect. Yes, excellent. So if we bring this together, we have the full Plex price model. First of all, access to the game. Either you pay a subscription or you try to find Plex in game. How to find, uh, how to make ISK in game? Well, either you do what the game offers you, mining, ratting, whatever, but that takes time, uh, so much ISK per hour, or you could simply bring a Plex into the game by paying real life money. And then we have the secondary market where these two forces meet. So, Plex will arise when there is a shift towards extra Plex demand, or when supply of Plex goes down, when less Plex is brought into the game, or of course, both at the same time. So, let's test our hy hypotheses. What about old school players quitting? Well, old school players have played the longest and they can make the most money, ISK per hour. So, these are typically the guys who want to buy Plex to like we call it in the game, plex their account. So if these guys were quitting, then there would be a relative shift towards subscriptions. Same thing in the uh, ISK market. Um, these are the guys making ISK per hour. A new player isn't going to make uh, a significant amount of ISKs. Uh, and typically, it's new players who buy plex. So you have a shift towards uh, relative shift towards Plex being brought into the game. If you put this together in the in-game market, then this should mean that prices go down. So clearly, this is not the case. And there was like this whole discussion about, no, don't bring fuzzy stuff into the game. People will quit en masse, especially in NullSec, where uh, the old school players typically are. Um, if you ever see masses of old school players quitting, they should be good for your Plex buying. I'm not saying it would be good for the game. <laughs> <It's> typically, <laughs> you don't want that as a game designer, but uh, Plex should go down whenever this happens. So, how about no new players? It would be the opposite effect, but we have data on this. It's not perfect. Uh, if we look at the year before these spikes, or the last spike happened, you look at uh, newborn players, so this is characters, it's almost scarily stable. So, and this is not the same as new players entering the game, but there must be a correlation, right? If players stop entering the game, then they're also not making characters. So, 
No, that's not it either. What about speculation? Dirty speculators. Uh, this is an interesting one because all the other dynamics will stay the same. Some people are bringing pl uh, Plex into the game, some people are Plexing their accounts, but on top of that, you have speculators, eh, players, buying extra Plex to put it on the side because they expect that the price will go up. Nobody's going to do that if they expect that the price will go down. Um, so that means that you get a demand shift. Price should go up, but quantity should also go up. If the normal Plex buying stuff is happening and people buy Plex on top of that, then you see, should see rising volumes. And here on the bottom you have volumes. As you can see in the first spike, you actually get an increase in volume on the down side. So that's certainly not the case here. And in the second spike, the most dramatic one, where Plex went to 1.3 billion, um, you actually see no change in volume. So we see no significant contribution of speculation. So that's not it either. So, what else could be causing these spikes? Because they don't happen out of the blue. There must be something going on. Now, um, this isn't as related as the next thing to price spikes, but there has been a long-term shift from subscriptions towards free-to-play in the gaming industry as a whole. Facebook games, League of Legends and came, et cetera, et cetera. So here we get a gradual shift away from subscriptions. And also less people want to buy Plex with real life money, because that's also paying for the game, right? So you get a shift away from Plex supply as well which means that gradually the price should be going up as this trend continues. And in long-term data from 2011 to 2015, we see that trend, but still eh, it doesn't explain, like here that's the first spike, it doesn't explain these spikes, it's just something that you need to be aware of. So, um, what else can we find that correlates, correlates with these spikes? This will seem uh, out of the blue at first, but if we look at the ruble price in terms of euros, so this is the amount of rubles you have to give to buy one euro, then we see that that's actually quite well correlated. Goes up when, when Plex goes up, etc. If we look at the same thing in terms of US dollars, you have the same pattern. Now, this is just picking. Uh, one year and, and showing some correlations, but if we look at five years on the bottom graph, that's the ruble price per US dollar since 2011. It has for a very long time a trend around 30 euros, uh, 30 dollars in this case, 30. And then exactly when Plex spikes, you see it jump to 70, maybe 75 rubles per US dollar which is an increase of 133%. If you're a Russian player, EVE just got more than twice as expensive at this point. Then it goes down again, and boom, again as expensive. So what about Russian players? So part of the demographic of EVE players having to pay twice as much in terms of rubles uh, to play the game. Well, you would get a shift away from dollars and euros from Russian players, and this is kind of important, that's why I put this here, you can't pay in rubles, so Russian players have no choice. Uh, and the Russian players will basically uh, uh, increase the demand for Plex and start rotting more. That's actually what we saw. And this would increase the price of Plex without a shift in volume. So we ruled out speculation due to uh, no shift in volume, but this is what you would see in this case. So we have a long-term shift in preferences, uh, not really related to spikes, but uh, we have at the same time that the Plex price spikes, uh, dramatic movements in foreign exchange ruble US dollar, foreign exchange ruble euro. This one's very interesting as well. When this happens, something else is doing the exact same move. Depends on how you show the graph. When the ruble becomes, uh, when you need to pay 
much more rubles for the same US dollar. That happens at the same time as the oil price crash. And it goes from here 95 to around 45. The magnitude is about the same. Now, we do know that Russia's main export product is oil. So when oil suddenly loses value, people need less rubles to buy oil from Russia, and the value of rubles goes down. You see it actually exactly the same pattern. So this is certainly, uh, there's certainly a link there. It's not hard to argue. So these plex price spikes, we can show that they're correlated with a collapse in the oil price. And we're getting to kind of interesting real life stuff. Now, why, why did the oil price collapse? So um, it's still ongoing. I'll just show some headlines to save time. Eh? Geopolitics. Oil prices at the mercy of geopolitics. You know, there's some stuff happening in the Middle East and has been for a while. Well, geopolitics. But uh, eh, why stop here? There's this interesting dynamic going on. Eh? Accelerating US oil production is a key cause of declining oil prices. If you look at the change in production between 2008 and 2014, surprisingly, this surprised me, it's the US that's doing this over, well, increased production uh, of oil. It's not OPEC, it's not Saudi Arabia. And also very interesting, as the oil price collapses, the US increases its oil production. Now, this probably doesn't make a lot of sense even to people who produce stuff in-game. If the price goes down, will you start producing more of it? Probably not. Now, there is an explanation for this that makes sense. I find this actually very appealing. Um, a lot of this US oil production was eh, around shale oil. And these companies borrowed money because interest rates are so low. You may know that interest rates are around 0% now. So you can borrow a whole lot of money for the same monthly um, interest cost. And in the US, this was mainly, well, invested in a couple of sectors. A couple of sectors went like Bleh. But a lot of investment was in oil production, shale oil production. Now, that's interesting because if you fund your investment with debt, you can't just stop. At the end of the month, you have to make an interest payment. So, and as the price of oil goes down, it actually gets worse because you have to produce more oil to sell at a lower price and have the same income to pay for your interest payment. So, this, also, this would explain why the US is increasing its oil production without going into stuff like but don't they see that this oil production is hurting their Russian friends? <laughs> Why would they do that? <laughs> so simply interest rate dynamics can also explain this. And you probably know that we're at 0% interest rates because of the financial crisis, so there you go. Financial crisis also feeds into these dynamics. So game events don't explain this stuff. But if we look at real-world events, you get a much better explanation, which is very interesting. If you look back, and we had two theories, Eve is like the real world, maybe Eve is a mirror, but this stuff that I just showed suggests that there's more going on than that. The way I see it, Eve is a virtual world. It's not physical. It's a virtual world, but through markets, it seems connected to the real world. I see it as a virtual emerging market country. At least it shows those dynamics. Capital controls, inflowing money causing spikes. Even though the game producers don't want this, they can't, they don't really seem able to insulate the EVE market from flows of money from the outside market. Although they try. So, what does this mean? I don't know. This is the new stuff. 2016 stuff. So the price spiked to 1.3, and then it sort of, actually the ruble troubles got worse around this, but other stuff happened and it makes it even more complicated. Some, some, sometimes something simply happens in the game. At the bottom right, you see <laughs> what is really uh, dramatic, uh, a spike in plex traded. 
it goes from around 3,000 to, what is it, 17, 18,000? That's kind of significant. Um, anyone have any idea what happens here? Skill injectors. So there was a lot of demand for these skill injectors. To buy the skill injectors, you need Plex. And apparently, people threw a lot of Plex at this to get the ISK to buy the skill injectors. So this is a purely in-game dynamic. And it's the two like real-world dynamics and in-game dynamics that will cause the total uh, effect in, in Plex. Uh, in Plex prices, so that makes it even more complicated. It's not even just oil. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can see, uh, due to this dynamic, um, Plex volumes don't stay this high, but they stay elevated, and Plex price has been going down quite a bit. Uh, this is a dynamic that it's really too early to go into this in detail, but I would like to uh, investigate this further maybe for an next FanFest. So, ah, yes, the good stuff. Uh, normally, uh, I look at war and markets. Why is this interesting? In the real world, you also uh, there's not just war in EVE Online. There's also wars in the real world, and they affect markets, but it's really hard to do scientific checks, scientific te testing, research on this stuff, because you don't find the data. Uh, dear government of Somalia, please send me all your data. It's not going to happen. Uh, if we report this, it will be in this format. Uh, you look for as many stars as possible, but I thought this would bore you guys. So I made a visual presentation of that. It's written in C++11. And let's show this. Oh, yeah. Um, this will, sh oh, yeah. First, I'll explain what we will see. Um, it shows in green the price of tritanium in the region that we're looking at. In red, it shows the size of the conflict that's going on. What I do is I look back 50 days and I count the number of system turnovers. So when a system's conquered, you know that there's serious conflict going on. It's not just shooting somebody's ship. Uh, there's, it takes some serious effort to conquer other people's space. When this happens, what we want to show is that it causes an effect on markets in the sense that there's these new people coming in, they conquer the space from the uh, previous residents, and these previous residents will try to sell their stuff, the, the stuff that they can't take. And the question is, basically, how far do they want to go? Uh, how many losses are people willing to incur? We know this happens in the real world as well, but there's no data. We can't quantify it. This is an interesting approximation. And if you look at uh, places where there's a lot of uh, conflict, there's small green spots. So green is uh, an indication of the price of uh, tritanium. When the green dot is really small, it means there's a very, very, very low price. Volumes typically go up but people sell for a really low price. You know this as fire sales, right? So we want to show that. Uh, the date sets, uh, starts in 2007. This is an event from 2009. Any idea what this is? What happens at the end of the Great War in Delve, Quirius, and period basis? Stuff. So. You may recognize this as the EVE universe. You may recognize this as a turning, twisting. This is just for fun. Uh, the data set starts in 2007, like I said. Uh, you'll see the date here. And let's just run this thing. So. We are in the period of the Great War. And as you can see, there's actually a lot of conflict in EVE Online. Of course, it's not called the Great War for nothing. There's a lot of fighting. Uh, around this time, uh, I'm actually flying in this with the Band of Brothers invading the North with the Max campaign. You know, uh, Sir Mola got together with a, lot of, with a bunch of friends and had a barbecue, and that's how it ended. Boom! Band of Brothers blows up. We're in 2009 now, and this is basically what happens after. Uh, stuff gets rearranged. Space is taken from other people. 
and let's bring in prices. So what we're looking for is when conflict spikes, and there's a bit of a lull in the conflict now, when conflict spikes, it should have a depressing effect, look at cloud ring, uh, Kalevala expanse, uh, on the market, and very important as well, when the new occupiers, well, the, when the new residents move in, they should set up their economy and, and prices should stabilize. We see this. We don't always see this. It was actually interesting period basis. Uh, after the Fountain War, it took a really long time for it to stabilize, which was kind of interesting. As you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on in the East. This is Russians fighting Russians, as Russians do. It's large. Uh, uh, amounts of conflict. There's actually some, let's pause that for a second. Um, in end of 2015, beginning of 2016, you'll see another spike, and that's relevant for us because that's like three months ago, uh, that I would like you to uh, focus on because that will be important in the next thing. But now uh, we get to the fountain more, left, uh, south, uh, west basically, bang. So that's the cries of test as they have to flee. But they, they get their revenge, so it's all fine. Ah, uh, oh yeah, oops. Any idea what this is, 2014? A Halloween starts, some titans die, and this is the aftermath. It's a uh, conflict between N3 and the Russians that the Mitanni tries to place there, and it doesn't really go according to plan, but there's a lot of conflict. This is the renter empires uh, being given up. Now we're in 2015. N3 will try to invade the Imperium. Doesn't really work that way. Some struggle. And here we get, boing, this is Red Alliance. <laughs> Show that in a second. And we stop right before we see conflict. Uh, today's war, because I want to go into detail into that. So, going back to the slides, that was a demo. We don't have a lot of time to go to this in detail, and I want to spend more on this. Actually, let's see that. Um, the next thing goes in detail. It's based on structural balance theory and structural realism. Uh, I wanted to add it because it's really relevant now with the war going on. Uh, I actually won't show the, the research that we're doing, but just the, the result uh, of uh, basically the visualizations that I can show you to show the current conflict. Uh, the idea is that uh, alliances will form coalitions. This is from uh, a, a paper that's been published on this. And here you see the situation in 1907 where you get basically, in the real world, the blue donut. This is one side fighting the other side, and there's just really two big blocks. So we will see this in EVE Online as well. Now, think back to the last FanFest, if you were here or if you, here, or if you saw the, uh, the videos. Uh, the theme of the last FanFest, there, there were actually real live baked blue donuts, if you remember. So it was the blue donut. Terrible, terrible. There's a blue donut. Nobody's fighting anyone. That's actually not true. This is how it looks in the data that I have that I'll be showing you. Um, basically, in every line, it shows the it shows an alliance and their standings towards the other alliances in the data set. I use the colors as, the, as they are used in the game. So dark blue is very friendly, blue is friendly, um, orange is hostile, red is very hostile. Uh, I use yellow for set to zero, so set to neutral, and gray is unset. Let's take a look. For example, eh, I pick Goon Swarm Federation uh, here, and so this is standings to itself, then standings to the next guys. The next guy is a circle of two, known as really staunch allies of uh, Goon Swarm Federation in 2015, when this starts. Uh, fatal Ascension, etc. So here we see the Imperium. 
What I do is I have this data in unordered format, and then I look for similarities, rows that are similar to other rows, and I use a community detection algorithm to cluster them together. And here you see, maybe for the first time in FanFest, the coalitions. So you know there's a lot of fighting, you know there's a lot of alliances, but really only four large players really play a role here. You have CFC here, then this block is entry, Bloomswarm, Nulskunda, and a bunch of others. This is Provi block. <laughs> Yay, Provi is it. And uh, this block is Brave Collective. So, uh, oh yeah, and, and Test Alliance. They, they become sort of important at a certain point. Um, let's take a look at that. So, I have two views here. One is this adjacency matrix view. The other is the geopolitical view. For example, I'll pick goons. What this is showing is, in green, the alliance that I typed with system and who owns it. In blue, their allies, and basically standings towards everyone else in the universe at this point. Uh, so I'll show you the blue donut. This is the one side. This is the other side. As you can see, blue versus blue around an unconquerable area of high and low sec. Cool. Then we also have Provi block here. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, there was a cute brave here. And that was basically of the universe. OK. If we go, oh yeah. Whoops. Because that will be annoying otherwise. To our adjacency matrix view, here you have N3, Brave, and Test, uh, CFC, and Provi block. So moving forward, this is what it will look like. You'll see daily takes of data uh, clustered. And the date is here. So we're already in February. And as you can see, on a daily basis, not that much changes. So let's go to FanFest. This is a couple of days before the last FanFest, 16th of March. And let's take a look at darkness. Voila. So the armies have arranged. Uh, the entry is going to invade and to the CFC. And this is what happens. At the 18th, you have to really spot it, at the 18th of March, this system is taken by N3. Daku 5. Uh, it is claimed sovereignty-wise, uh, on the 19th of March, and this is when FanFest starts. And then a whole debacle occurs, because that's the only system N3 will take, and from that, the CFC goes on a counterattack, and alliances start falling. At the time, there was a question, where's Nolly? Huh? And uh, the Russians start counterattacking here, CFC counterattacks here, and basically, I will now go fast. You see the coherence of the N3 coalition fall apart. And new coalitions form. At this point, I'll try to show it quickly, uh, you have the Imperium, you have the Russians, you have Shadow of Death here, more Russians, Red Alliance, you have Test Alliance here, you have Darkness, and you have Black Legion ah. 
here. And uh, the story then basically continues. Uh -huh. Uh, we're now in September of 2015, and let me show you quickly. This is now Red Alliance that I'm showing. This is the precursor of the war, Red Alliance. Loses space and collapses. We're now in January 2016. This is Shadow of Death. This is Test. Basically what happens is that this entry block that fell apart is reforming. And they succeed to consolidate their space and this is basically what leads to the new war. You have the Imperium that, they, that couldn't be challenged because N3 had fallen apart. You had seven different uh, coalitions. And here they start to coalesce and we go to today's situation. This is March 2016. Here my algorithm starts looking for, uh, starts finding larger coalitions. If we, voila, things start getting together. And if we look at Today's data, yesterday's data, you have the CFC here, now the Imperium. You have this large block that is fighting the Imperium. These are the Russian allies of the Imperium, and this is still Provi block. So, interestingly, the situation where we started is reinstated. So, we again have the Blue Donut. But, to conclude, We had the Blue Donut in uh, last FanFest. Now we have a similar situation, but you probably know that Losec is now also involved. Uh, Shadow Cartel, Tissue, those guys are also involved fighting the Imperium. And that actually means that you know, the Donut idea comes from NullSec around HiSec and Losec. Now Losec is also involved. So you have a wider Donut. So we started from the Blue Donut, and I now present to you the super blue donut, which is today's situation. Thank you. I would like to thank Wallari from Dotlang, Kreba from Evenline.com, Aaron Branson, who is my collaborator on the structure balance data, and of course CCP for making this possible. That's it. Any questions? Second? Yes. Uh, the plex price that I show. Uh, let's see. This one. Uh, so this is September. So it would have been October. October two thousand fifteen. It's almost identical today. This is what I took uh, a couple of days ago, so price is going down, but yeah. Thank you for your attention. There we go.